Well, Jack, thank you very much indeed for giving us your time. And let me start by asking you about Frankie and Johnny, this really seminal work and an extremely important creation in the whole history of American music and theatre. And this collaboration between Jerome Moross and Ruth Page. Now, how did that come about? How was it that Ruth Page and Jerome Moross got together? Well, apparently, according to some of the reference books, the reference sources that I've read, Ruth Page was alerted to the existence of Jerome Moross by uh, Jerome Moross's friend and colleague, Aaron Copeland. And uh, they did, uh, Moross and Page and Bentley Stone did two ballets uh, called An American Pattern and then Frankie and Johnny. And then later, uh, another ballet called Guns and Castanets, which is an updating of the Bizet Carmen story uh, with the action transferred to the Spanish Civil War. Now, one of the curious things about Frankie and Johnny, certainly, is who actually choreographed what. Uh, the credits read, uh, usually, choreography by Ruth Page and Bentley Stone. And the question comes up, who did most of it? Was Ruth Page's name first because she did most of the choreography, or was it first out of politeness on the uh, grounds of ladies first, and therefore her name would be put first? And as far as uh, people know and are trying to uh, talk to people who had been around at that time, Ruth was responsible for uh, the basic concept, and her own part, she played uh, Frankie, uh, who killed Johnny, but Bentley Stone was basically uh, responsible for the rest of the ballet and its details. And Frankie and Johnny really is, don't you think, it's really something new, in particular in the way that it addresses this very powerful subject of low life, if we may say that, in America. It's got this quality of I feel reality, a kind of verismo, if I can use that rather inappropriate word in some respects, but what I mean is a real realism about the life of Frankie and Johnny, this prostitute and her lover, right as it really would have felt at the time in the 1930s in the most run-down parts, run-down city parts of the United States. And I think that, for me, is something enormously interesting because it really gives a very direct and no sort of reservations view, doesn't it, of that kind of society at that time. And I think it, it's fair to say that that really is something quite new at that level, if we like, in that particular way in the history, well, not only of American theatre and American music, but I would say in the history of ballet. Yes, it is. Uh, Jerome Moross was interested in... Uh what has come to be known as Americana, America, American rhythms, American subject matter. Ruth was too, and Bentley Stone, and both Bentley Stone and his partner, Walter Cameron, uh, were interested in American dance styles. They were interested in the history of American dance, and all these people had come from a very rich dance background. Ruth had uh, uh, studied and danced with a a whole raft of uh, distinguished teachers, and she had uh, danced with distinguished companies, including Anna Pavlova's company and Diaghlev's pioneering trailblazing uh, ballet russe. Bentley Stone had uh, a similarly varied background, and he had also danced with uh, Marie Rambert's pioneering ballet Rambert in London. And Ruth was also interested in modern dance, she toured for a season or two as the partner of the great German modern dancer, Harold Kreutzberg. And so they brought a very rich background uh, to their choreography. It's also um, unusual for the time in that uh, this was a period in which it was depression. Uh, the depression was on, there was economic uncertainty, uh, there was the Dust Bowl in the uh, uh, Southwest, and it was a time in which people were uh, ready to affirm American values, 
American painters, poets, writers, dramatists, choreographers, and dancers were eager to affirm American values as American ideals and aspirations. Moros, on his first trip to the West, got out of a train in Albuquerque and walked to the edge of the city and beheld the the desert uh, expanding beyond him and was absolutely floored by it. And when he got to California, he was absolutely floored by it in yet another way. Uh, Moros was captivated, bowled over by the American West. Yes, I think it's fascinating, isn't it, to see how he saw the whole picture of the country he loved so much, America, the romantic side that you've just described, where he was completely overwhelmed by the beauty and the majesty of the scenery, but also the seamier side and the very uh, difficult side of poverty and violence, which he addressed, it seems to me, in a way that was not negative, but really, with Ruth Page, in a way that was almost an outcry and full of pathos. And I think it's fair to say, don't you, that probably the ballet itself, Frankie and Johnny, this is not the kind of experience that the audience, the ballet audience of the time, would have expected to have seen something uh, really different, not at all in any kind of tradition of any ballet sort at all at that time. No, it's not. Uh, Frankie and Johnny is a very urban ballet. Uh, it's a, about a, a ballet that takes place in the slums, about a, uh, infidelity and murder in a very gritty section of a big city. And, uh, well, Ruth Page, certainly back in the 30s, was concerned with social problems and social issues, including uh, the status of women. Her uh, ballet, uh, An American Pattern, which was presented on the same program that included the premiere of Frankie and Johnny, was a ballet about a rich woman, a wife, who felt uh, uh, smothered by forces of conformity. And she tries to have affairs with a number of different types of men, uh, but even so, she's always driven back into a state of conformism. And that, Ruth said at the time, was an American pattern and a very unfortunate one. So I suppose you could say that she was a, a pioneer in feminism in American ballet. Yes, and I think from what we can hear in some of the interviews we have of Jerome Moros that he himself was, I wouldn't say a feminist, but he felt very strongly on the side of women, I think. I think he was very enlightened in that respect, certainly for that time, and felt uh, a, a, not a mission, but a passion, perhaps is a better word, to try to represent, shall we say, a better world for them in, in his work. And and in Frankie and Johnny, I think that's, in a sense, what's so strong about this piece. It is violent, but with a message, uh, a message not of hope, but a, uh, an outcry, perhaps, a protest. I think it must have been a shock, really, for the public in 1938. I, I really don't think anything like that had been heard or seen before. Yeah, I suspect it was, yeah. It's also possibly one reason why Frankie and Johnny is the one ballet, uh, Page Stone ballet, that I have seen with the score by uh, Moros, that uh, it's the only ballet uh, that they have done that I have actually seen. And I think it's a very good ballet, but I suspect this one reason why it has not been done more often is uh, its subject matter. Too many people in uh, America, certainly back then and even to this day, assume that ballet must be pretty. And ballet doesn't have to be pretty. And Frankie and Johnny is not pretty. And from all that I've read about it, an American pattern surely was not pretty. It was gritty and grubby and witty, and it uh, possibly worldly and a bit cynical, but it was not pretty. And yet there are to this day people who think that ballet must be pretty. And I think that's to the detriment of, of ballet in America and possibly ballet around the world. 
Yes, that's yet another example of Jerome Moross's special creativity, isn't it, that he, in partnership with Ruth Page, that he was on the same wavelength as somebody who was challenging herself the expected role of ballet and was thinking of a subject, regardless of what kind of mould it would be in. And this element of partnership, this was something that was, of course, to recur later on in the next very important theatre work after the war that occurred with Jerome Moros and John Latouche. Of course, there was Ballet Ballads, and then after that there was The Golden Apple. His relationship with John Latouche and the collaboration he had with John Latouche, do you have any information that you can tell us at all as to how, with the creation of Ballet Ballads, for instance, how the concept arose? I mean, was this an initiative of John Latouche, or was it an initiative of Jerome Moros, who actually thought of the idea and then began to build on it? Who was, who was really the kind of, if you like, catalyst? Mm-hmm. I have no, I have no uh, firm evidence one way or the other on that, as who did what. But in terms of ballet ballads, John Latouche was certainly considered at the time a witty and sophisticated lyricist, and Jerome Moros uh, had been interested in uh, speech in ballet uh, and song in ballet. Frankie and Johnny, one of his, one of the most unusual touches of Frankie and Johnny, are the three women in Salvation Army uniforms who, from time to time, break into the action and sing verses from the old ballad the old folk ballad about Frankie and Johnny, and that was considered unusual at the time, and it still is unusual when you see it today. The program called them Saving Susies, possibly as a a tactical way of avoiding any conflict with the actual Salvation Army, which might have been offended, and especially since towards the end of the ballet, the Saving Susies lift out of nowhere beer beer glasses and take a swig of beer. Uh, It is a rather boozy ballet. (laughs) Yes. And the whole concept of having on the stage in a ballet speech, and I know this was something that Jerome Moros felt very strongly about, a feeling of integration where there wasn't a clear demarcation between the dance, the music, and the singing, sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, Wagner's idea of an an entire artwork. Again, not a very appropriate um, analogy, but I'm going to use it just in that the approach of Jerome Moros particularly, I think, that there should not be um, departments of performance, that he was aiming at a complete kind of spontaneous interaction between everybody. That's very ahead of its time, isn't it? Yes, it is, and it's ahead of the ballet time, certainly, and it's ahead of the ballet time even now. I think people would uh, get disturbed, or are disturbed, any time people try to inject uh, uh, speech or song into ballet. Uh, Ballet must be dancing and only dancing, and if you try to make it a, a composite artwork involving speech and or song, people get disturbed by this. Uh, But a number of attempts were made at that, even at the time of uh, Frankie and Johnny. There is, uh, near the end of Aaron Copeland's ballet, Billy the Kid, a sudden pause, and then out of the shadows, Billy the Kid says, who's there? And of course, it's Pat Garrett who's going to shoot him down. That one line of speech did surprise people uh, back in the 1930s, And I've noticed that sometimes when Billy the Kid is revived today, it still surprises people. It is a surprising moment. And uh, much later, a decade later, in Fall River Legend, which is Agnes DeMille's ballet about Lizzie Borden, the so-called axe murderess, uh, there is speech in that. In fact, it begins with speech in which uh, the document condemning her to capital punishment, condemning her to be hanged, is spoken aloud by the foreman of a jury, and and that's surprising too. And I wonder whether more could be done uh, with such unions of speech and dance and music. 
Of course, whilst we're just discussing this that has just come into my mind now, we mustn't forget Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe. Um, I suppose when I said before that what um, Jerome Moros and Latouche were doing here was um, very new, yes, of course it was, but um, that concept of um, having every kind of wonderful art form cohabiting on an equal level, that, of course, I think we, we mustn't forget Sergei Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe for that. So in that sense, uh, maybe ballet ballads, even Frankie and Johnny, um, but certainly ballet ballads, I think, in that sense, is, is a child of, or if, if perhaps a better way of putting it is, a corollary uh, of the Ballet Russe of Sergei Diaghilev. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, Diaghilev did think of ballet as a Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, not all of them had speech, but he had uh, certainly uh, the ideal of blending dance, dramatic action, great music, and great scenery together into one composite, harmonious, and uh, striking whole. Yes, so um, Jerome Ross, of course, would have been aware of that. He was a very cultivated and extremely enlightened person. As I said before, we have some very interesting interviews with him that will be on this program. And he really does come across as a wonderfully aware person with a very deep and wide knowledge of many elements of the arts, not just music and ballet, but literature and other cultural elements as well. And I think that that's a very important part of his music, really, because um, he was very eclectic. Um, even so, at the same time, uh, I think it's true to say, well, would you agree with me, that there is a dance element in a lot of his music, a feeling of the dance that permeates a lot of his music that isn't necessarily written for dance, not necessarily written for the ballet. Yes, I would agree. I don't know all that much of Moross's music, but just recently I heard a recording of a very late Moross work, The Flute Concerto, which charmed me. I, I thought it was a very charming work with a great verve to it, a rather dance-like verve. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is nice. Somebody could even set a ballet to it. I wonder if anyone ever will. Yes, that's a good idea. We ought to suggest that and make that idea well known. Um, just continuing, if I may, on this theme, even when you get to The Golden Apple, which is such a different work, one of the things that's so interesting for me about Moros is the character and style and feeling of his music varied so much according to the subject matter that he was setting, certainly in his theatre works. But that, that, that dance element, I think it's, it's strongly there, don't you, in The Golden Apple? Yes, it is. And that makes me wonder what... Moross's music as a whole is like. I think Moross may be getting, a, over the years, may have gotten a bad deal because, for one thing, he was associated in some people's imagination with two types of music, dance music and film music. And there are certain snobs, certain uh, snobbish people who consider both those forms of music inferior forms, and they need not be. Oh, no, they're two extremely important forms, particularly for the 20th century, I think. Well, Jack, this has been extremely valuable and certainly very enlightening for me to talk with you about Jerome Ross. Anything else you would like to add? No, I would like to add, say one more thing. There aren't that many dance scores by Moross. But neither are, that, uh, are there all that many dance scores by his contemporaries, Aaron Copeland and Morton Gould. Again, were both of them uh, prevented or psychologically prevented from doing more dance scores because of the whole notion that uh, ballet music is not serious? And what have, we, uh, what have we robbed ourselves of? Indeed, well, actually, Ruth Page at one point robbed herself of another Moross score on a subject which uh, would be right up his alley, so to speak. She had gotten the idea, oh, about a decade after Frankie and Johnny, of doing a ballet about the former baseball player who turned evangelist uh, named Billy Sunday. And this was a, a ballet that would have not only music, but the dancers themselves reciting 
elements of uh, Billy Sunday's sermons. And she told me that the first person that she thought of for writing the music was Moross, but Moross at that time was unavailable, and Ruth rashly and ill-advisedly, I think, turned to another composer, Remy Gassman, and I asked her, what is Remy Gassman's score for Billy Sunday like? And she told me, oh, it's, all, it's too academic, too Hindemithian. Uh, Moross would have been the better choice. Well, that's quite something to hear that, yes. I think Frankie and Johnny, one, don't you think? I think it would sit very well now in, in many ballet companies and many theatres. It's never aged. It still seems to be very confrontational, very vivid and very real. I, I would hope that some companies, more than we've seen in, in recent years, would, would take it up. I'm sure it would, it, it would create a, a very strong impression today, don't you think? Yes, I think so, yeah. And I'd like to see it again. Uh, the last company I saw do it was Dance Theatre of Harlem. And well, Dance Theatre of Harlem temporarily went out of business for a while, and I hope now that it's back it will bring back Frankie and Johnny. Well, there's a very important advocacy for Frankie and Johnny for the future from Jack Anderson. Jack, thank you very, very much indeed for giving us this invaluable conversation about Jerome Moross in his centenary year. I've loved every minute of speaking with you. Good to talk with you, John.